let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our heart be always acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sooner or later, it will happen to all of us. All hell will break loose. Lives are lost, families are torn asunder, dreams are dashed, hopes are vanquished, lifestyles are changed, all hell breaks loose. All hell breaks loose all the time. It happens to individuals, it happens to nations, and it happens to churches. Love dies and divorce follows, cancer strikes, and the primary source of income is taken away. An only child turns to drugs, tragedy strikes, life falls apart, trouble comes, sickness brings us low, old age replaces youth and vitality, death comes. Yes. All hell breaks loose. It can and it does happen, suddenly and without warning. Yes. A normal routine day turned out for many yesterday to be the worst day of their lives. All hell broke loose. Now, for those of you who have a problem with me saying hell from the pulpit, you need to know that hell is a fact of our existence. Amen. My theology of hell is that while we are trying to get to heaven, we are either experiencing hell, catching hell, or going through hell. It seems to me that if you want to go to heaven, you've got to go through some hell. I've got some witnesses in here. The poetic paradigm of the person of Job points to a time in biblical narrative when all hell broke loose. The length of the text and the limitations on our time today will not allow me to give a full review of the life of Job, but just let me say this. Job went from riches to rags and from bad to worse in quick time and in rapid succession. The Bible records that there was a man by the name of Job who lived in the land of Uz, wherever Uz was. We learn that Job was a good man, a decent man, a faithful husband, a doting father, and a successful businessman. In addition to all these noble attributes, we learn that Job was a man of deep faith and spiritual conviction. He was a righteous man who loved God and would have nothing to do with evil. Because of all this, Job was the most prosperous man of his time. The scripture tells us that there was nobody greater than Job in the land. He had many cattle, he had many sheep, donkeys, and goats. All of his businesses were turning a profit. His seven sons and three daughters were good kids who loved him and who loved each other. The, the children of Job were a close-knit group, so much so that they spent time with each other, hanging out at each other's homes. They ate together and they played together. Job's faith was such that on the occasions when his sons and daughters got together, he would pray and fast on their behalf just in case they had done something wrong. Yes, yes. This is the 
the exemplary life that Job lived. Now here's where the drama takes off. The action moves from heaven to earth. One day, as the story goes, the sons of God, an angelic host of messengers, come to present themselves before God, and Satan comes with them. Among this heavenly contingent gathered to hang out with God is Satan, a fallen messenger. We always want to picture Satan as pathetic and evil and wicked. And Satan is that, but Satan did not start out that way. Satan was an angel in heaven with access and a line of communication to God. But whenever you start to think that you are as big as God, then you are in trouble. And that is exactly what happened with Satan. Satan thought that access to God makes you God. Let me pull over here and say much like some people of color think access or being adjacent to whiteness makes you white. Until we are reminded of that fallacy when we are pulled over by the police, but I digress. And God So even though the sons of God came to present themselves before God and Satan comes among them, his status and his position has changed. And even in a crowd of angelic personalities, Satan got God's attention. I don't know how. I don't know what happened. Maybe he was late for the meeting. Maybe he was wearing some strange clothing, something that Satan had on was a little bit different, something that Satan did on that day got God's attention. And God said to Satan, where have you been and where are you coming from? Satan answered, from walking back and forth on the earth looking for someone to devour looking for someone to mess with and mess up. Make no mistake about it, beloved Satan. Satan has one purpose and one purpose only in this world, and that is to destroy this world, to mess up your life, to ruin your marriage, to break up your home, to wreck this society. Satan told God, I've been looking for someone to destroy. Without a second thought, God offers up Job. Job is minding his own business, doing his thing, and he's about to become a participant in some divine, satanic, drama, trauma between God and Satan. God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? He is a good man. One who is into righteous, godly living, who will have nothing to do with evil. Theologically, Satan accuses Job of serving God only because God takes such good care of him. Satan says that the reason Job worships God is not because is, is not because God is worthy of worship, but because he has a big house and many possessions and a good family. This argument by Satan is strangely modern in its context, beloved, because one is made to wonder whether or not many of us are doing the same thing. When things go well, we worship God. Do we worship God because of who God is or because God is taking such good care of us at the time? And when you listen to some testimonies, Yesterday. 
Satan and said to God, no wonder Job serves you. You're taking such good care of him. But take all of his possessions away from him. And he will curse you to your face. God said, all right. All that he has is in your hands. Only do not touch his life. So Satan's response will show me back and find it. God gives Satan these instructions. All that he has is in your hands. Only do not put your hands on him. And all Satan goes. And for Job, all hell yes. is about to break loose. Yes. Look at what happens in the life of Job. One day, a messenger comes and tells Job that the Sabaeans raided Job's field and took all of his oxen and donkeys and killed all of his servants, and he was the only one left to tell. Three times, Scripture tells us, Job received breaking news of one crisis after another. Three times, it says, while he was still speaking. Three servants of Job have escaped to bring him the news that fire fell from heaven and burned his sheep and servants. The Chaldeans formed a gang and killed his camels and his servants. And finally, a great earthquake came and fell on the home of his eldest son, and all of his children were killed. While Job was hearing the news of one event, somebody was bringing him more bad news. Before he could digest the horror of one report, somebody was bringing him worse news. Job was overwhelmed by events in his life and the circumstances that were spinning out of control. For Job, all hell was breaking loose. He lost everyone and everything that he ever had. And there was nothing, absolutely nothing, he could do about it. Job got up and tore his clothes and shaved his head, which is an ancient symbol of mourning, pain, and grief. And then he fell to the ground and worshiped God. And listen to what he said. <coughs> Naked I came from my mother's womb. And naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The book of Job, the oldest book in the Bible, has been problematic in preaching and theology for some time because at the heart of its subject matter is the old age dilemma of why Our faith in 
in God is not immunization from the storms of this life. In fact, I believe that the opposite may be true. God offered Job to Satan because Job was the best that there was. He was a good man, a loving father, a good church member, if you will. He was an honest man of integrity and credibility. And in God's eyes, that made Job a leading candidate to go through hell on earth. God knew that Job had been to every practice. God knew that Job was working out in the off season. He was in game shape. He had studied the playbook. He knew the game plan. And that is what is needed when you're going through hell. Yes, yes. When trouble comes into our lives, it may be because we are living right, not because we're doing anything wrong. Trouble comes to the best of us, the strongest among us and the most faithful. I heard a story by uh, Carol Knight the other day. She tells a story that I think helps to illustrate this point. She says she was playing golf at the Pinehurst Golf Club in North Carolina. She was playing well when it went from a sunny day to a stormy day. The clouds rolled in and it began to thunder, followed by lightning. She needed to run for cover. And having never been in this situation before, she ran toward the tallest tree on the golf course. When suddenly her golfing partner grabbed her arm and snatched her collar and directed her toward a tree that was not much more than a shrub. She said, what you doing? This tree is not going to even stop us from getting wet. Carolyn, you're a new golfer, and you need to know that lightning always strikes the tallest tree. <laughs> Beloved, when trouble comes to us, sometimes it's because we're the tallest tree. It is not necessarily because we are the worst. Sometimes it is because we are the best that God has to offer. Don't you know that in a world such as this, in a day such as this, in a time such as this, God needs some people who are doing something right. God needs people who are keeping the faith, who are standing for truth, who are checking the facts, who are not sold out to this casual Christianity that will not change anything, will not lift anyone, and will not deliver us. God needs some people who are familiar with the game, who can call off the bench to go in and score. This is not a day to bring people up to speed. We need people who know that they know that they know what they know. And Job got the call to come off the bench to go through hell because he was the best that God had to offer. Another thing that we need to know about going through hell is that Satan's access in our life is limited by God's sovereignty over our life. I'll say that again. Yes, yes. Satan's access in our life is limited by God's sovereignty over our life. Wake up now and write that down. is limited by God's sovereignty over our life. Satan has some power in this world, but God has all power in the world. And I don't know how bad things are in your life or in this world, but God is going to let Satan have only so much power, so much access. He took Job's possessions, he took Job's children, he inflicted Job's body with disease, but right Satan did not make 
this world and Satan will not be able to destroy this world. Amen. Satan can only do so much damage. He can only wreak so much havoc. He can only cause so much terror. He can only strike so much fear. God lets Satan have his way and have his say and have his day. But there is a but. Mm -hmm. And I know it looks like he's winning right now. People are afraid and feel hopeless even in this political climate in which we find ourselves existing. I know that it looks like he's winning right now, but it ain't over until God says it's over. Yeah. It ain't over until God decides that it's over. Everybody has been asking the question, though, what was God doing when all hell broke loose? In Job's life, and you can extrapolate and say, what was God doing when all hell broke loose in my life? The answer to that question is easy. God was doing whatever you were doing. Right. Wherever you were, that is where God was. We are God's representatives on this earth. We are God's hands and feet and eyes and ears. God goes where we take God. God has given Satan access to the world, but God has not given Satan sovereignty over the world. God will allow only so much confusion, so much chaos and challenge in your life. In this world, God will step in and get this world back on divine course. God will not allow trouble to last always, sickness to linger for long, evil to destroy us, darkness to overshadow us, and death to defeat us. Yes, wickedness is wide. God's mercy is wide. God loves us too much to leave us in the control of Satan's devices. And finally, I'm going to let you go. God is, I discovered, not going to explain God's self while you're going through hell. But I do know this. God is going to reveal God's self while you're going through hell. Why does God do it even for a season? in a different league than we 
from a different book of directions than we do. God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. God's actions are not our actions. Our attempts to extract explanations from God only frustrate our faith because God is just too deep. So God need not explain God's self to us. But this is what God does. God reveals God's self to yes. us. All of you, all of us who need an answer to your why. I'm sad to tell you that one is likely not coming, at least not from God. We know that there is evil in the world and people who hate us just because of who we are. And this is the only explanation that is coming. And that is the only explanation really that is needed. But you need to know and believe and trust this. In the midst of our trouble, in the midst of our going through hell, in the midst of great evil, God shows us God's power and wisdom and love. You need to know today that God is not dead. Hell will not last yes. always. Amen. 